So um, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good to see all your faces. I feel like the time between the last meeting and this meeting actually went by pretty quickly. Um, I, I did a little bit of travel, believe it or not, on some airplanes uh, since then. Um, I'm feeling good. So, you know, um, definitely worried about the, uh, the effects of that. Um, tonight, we've got some special guests joining us and Excuse me. We also have uh, we have a new member to the board. Um, so we will uh, we'll introduce everybody in a little bit. Um, we'll start off by uh, approving the agenda for tonight. If anybody has any uh, recommended changes for the agenda, the agenda tonight, we can discuss those. But if not, we can uh, we can move to approve the agenda. Move to approve. You uh, see, um, Max, can we can we do the can we do the uh, the call on uh, approving the um, the agenda for tonight? Sure, Mr. Brown. Oh uh, yes, Miss Carpenter. Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yep. Mr. Mendez? Yes. Mr. Watson? Yes. And Mr. Evans? Yes. All right, so the agenda is approved. Our next item is uh, adoption of minutes from the prior meeting. Does anybody have any recommended changes? No, no changes. We'd like to move that they be approved with our thanks to the vice chairman uh, for, for keeping these records. Yeah, thanks a lot, Stuart. I'm sure you've had to watch uh, replays of us on, uh, on Zoom and through Facebook, catch all the notes. It's very exciting. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. You're Living in this uh, pandemic world, being on Zoom is definitely a strange way to live and communicate. Um, okay, so if there's no recommended changes for the uh, minutes, I move that we go ahead and approve the minutes. Any seconds? Second. All right, so um, Ms. Robinson, can you do the do the roll? Please. Yes, yes. Um, I, I hate to get somewhat caught up in the weeds here, but of course, okay. Mr. Watson, you can't make the initial motion. So oh, okay. else has to. You can second, but you can't make the Roger motion. That. I think I made the motion, didn't I? Yeah, so. Oh, okay. Okay. And Bellamy. Sorry, no. it sounded like Mr. Watson. Okay. I think I may have. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Carpenter? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Mendez? Yes. And Mr. Watson? Yes. All right, so the meeting, the minutes are approved. All right, so we, uh, we've got a new member to our board. We've got a, uh, a local, local man that grew up in Charlottesville. And from everything I, I understand, he came back here uh, about a year ago and uh, wanted to make a difference in, in Charlottesville. And um, I think he has a lot of love for this city and look look forward to working with him. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bellamy Brown, could you introduce yourselves to everybody? Uh, sure. Um, like uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman Watson stated, <clears throat> and I think most of you know um, from here, um, came back to, to serve our community uh, in 2018. and. Um, I think that this uh, this board itself um, has a lot of value in being able to do that and for that end. Uh, and I look forward to uh, working with each of you. Welcome. Yeah. Right. Welcome aboard. James, you're on mute, I think. Your chairman seems to be muted. Sorry about that. 
Just asking, uh, Mr. Brown, what was one of your primary reasons for wanting to be a member of the uh, Police Civilian Review Board? Uh, sure. Um, so I uh, had my own incident with the uh, within the Commonwealth uh, in about 2017, um, <clears throat> and I saw firsthand uh, how a violation of uh, our constitutional um, rights can uh, take us down a path that we don't necessarily uh, want to go or even uh, belong. Um, and it's, you know, it's one thing, I mean, I've been to law school and everything. So it's one thing to understand this from a theoretical perspective, but when you have it to actually be applied, it's a, it's a completely um, different animal and you can real and you realize just how um, thin the, the line is between having your freedom and not having your freedom. Um, and I spent the better part of a year, um, you know, fighting the Commonwealth um, on, on that incident, which, you know, it was profiling and, and I did nothing wrong. Um, and that allowed me to see up close several times um, the, some of the experiences within uh, the general district courts across the Commonwealth and um, how policing is applied uh, in general. And I know that I was blessed enough to have the means to be able to navigate that situation well, whereas a lot of other people don't necessarily have the means to do that. And uh, through my experience and through my knowledge, I wanted to be able um, to give back uh, in this capacity because I think it's uh, a very valuable one. I think we, ha in, the, in our country, we have uh, two forms of important rights. One of them, are, or two forms of important freedoms. One of them uh, is economic freedom, um, the ability to um, you know, work and, and provide a living for your family. And the other is physical freedom. Um, and we can't afford to have um, governments, um, no matter what the role is, infringing upon that um, outside of the constitutional bounds. So um, that's pretty much the, the primary driver in addition to, you know, this being my home, my family has given a lot um, to this community um, over the years. And, you know, it's, uh, it's my turn to do so um, as well, so. All right, great. I, I got one more question too. Um, <laughs> coming at you with questions. Um, in six months from now, what would you like to see uh, this board accomplish? Um, just in reviewing a lot of the, a lot of the materials and everything, and seeing where we are right now compared to where you know my understanding of, of a civilian review board um, should be. I think um, um, some of the things I want to see accomplished is um, is the legitimacy, the credibility as an independent body, being able to um, allow our community members who feel that they've had their constitutional uh, liberties infringed upon by um, uh, local uh, government law enforcement, um, have a legitimate mechanism for them to bring their complaints and have it um, adequately uh, um, uh, investigated in a, in a impartial but professional way. Um, and to also be in a, in a collaborative uh, working relationship, both with uh, CPD, um, Charlottesville Police Department and Charlottesville City Council. I think that um, all three have to uh, understand it's it's um, the principles um, that we're after, not you know individual personalities. I think that those that's our the way I see it. That's our mandate from our community is to be able to provide um, that mechanism and to foster the relationships uh, to be able to do so. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you for sharing that vision. Okay, so we have um, a visitor from the, the legacy, uh, original Police Civilian Review Board, uh, Guillermo. Guillermo, how do you pronounce your last name? Is it Abuela? Abuela? Ubia, Guillermo Ubia. All right, so he was uh, one of the original members. Um, you know, throughout our meetings, normally uh, Sarah Burke tends to chime in. And, uh, you know, my, my plan is that I'd like to reach out to various members. So I'm sure there's other members that are watching and they're saying, well, you know, why didn't you invite me? And so as we're, as we're moving along in the upcoming months, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get everybody who's, who's interested in uh, being a part of our meetings. So I invited you because you, uh, you know, you largely help you and you and the prior board uh, build the framework by which we are operating under. And, um, you know, of course, a lot of times you build things and then you begin to see how they play out in reality. Now, you know, we're only about maybe eight, nine weeks into it. 
So there's a lot of things we're learning and then we're, we're doing it uh, during the pandemic. Um, while you guys were, were developing all the bylaws and the ordinance and everything, what are some of the lessons learned that you uh, gained from that process? Sure. First of all, thank you for um, having me on here. And thanks to everybody who's serving on the board. Thanks for your service. It is a daunting, but very, very vital task. So thank you for your time and your energy. Um, I was thinking uh, about this question a lot since we talked last week, and I think we're very different boards because our purpose was to establish a framework and your, your purpose is to sort of execute that framework. But I thought of two things that I would mention tonight that I think would be helpful. Things that at the end, I realized we did very early on that were very beneficial to us. The first is NACOL, the National Association of Civilian Oversight and Law Enforcement. Um, they're sort of the um, national group that oversees um, oversight boards, civilian review boards. We got in touch with them early on. Um, I got in touch with them within the first week of being uh, within our, of our meeting. And they were very beneficial to me and to us as we were going forward. They answered all of my questions. They came in and did a one day training for us that we found very beneficial. So I would, I, I would recommend somebody on the board become very good friend with Nicole and look at sort of their membership options. They do seminars, they do trainings, anything you can get from them. It, if it has to do with a civilian review board, they've seen it, they've seen it more than once and they're happy to talk to you about it. So they were, that was very helpful for us and for me as we were going through that. The other thing, and I don't know if this is too much in the weeds or not, but one thing that we did early on sort of procedurally was we divided into like action groups or subcommittees. I don't know what the legal term is, but we basically took all the things that we were supposed to do and we split them up. And we put two of us on that board because we can't have more than three according to FOIA rules. But that way we could, we did a lot of the work in between the meetings. And I think a lot of people don't understand how we, we met every two weeks, right? And those meetings for us were about two to four hours long, depending on the week. But in between that would be 10, 20, and at the end, almost 30 hours per week of work that happened. And a lot of that happened in these sort of little subgroups. So like Gloria Beard, who I think is on the call tonight, and I were part of the external research group. So we talked to a lot of other civilian review boards and we put together this spreadsheet of over 200 boards that we looked at in terms of how they operated. Somebody else was on the the police communication board and somebody else was on the city communication board. So it helped us to sort of have this division of labor and this structure so that things got done in between the meetings. All right, thank you. Yeah, we are having a uh, little bit of a challenge, you know, in between meetings, uh, you know, due to the lack of ability to be able to physically meet. That's That's been a, a bit of a challenge. I think the city will probably begin to hear that from probably all of its boards and commissions. But uh, for us in particular, you know, uh, literally most of us have never been in the same room. Uh, we, we, we've met once at Washington Park and we're you know, not allowed to talk about CRB business because it makes it a public meeting at that point. So we're really uh, trying to figure out how to overcome some of that or a lot of that really. Um, Kind of been thinking today it would be it would be good if the I don't know if the city is beginning to look at alternative ways uh, in which boards can meet you know like taking facilities like Carver Rec and uh, I, and I did a meeting last week like this with the Army Corps of Engineers where they just had a large space big tables we wore masks and we all got in the same place and some people that weren't there because maybe they have uh, you know higher level health concerns they had a video stream for people that weren't there, but being able to really get into um, space and talk about all this, as opposed to, because this kind of can feel like a, a dog and pony show, you know, on Zoom and on Facebook, but, you know, being able to get into a room with a laptop and, and a group of people and talk about things and, you know, learn each other's ideas and all that, that's definitely been uh, probably almost as challenging as homeschooling kids <laughs> at, at the moment. But, um, you know, nevertheless, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll conquer and, and move forward. Um, that was a lot of great information. Does anybody have any uh, questions for Guillermo? I including Sally, too, if you have a question. Well, it just, uh, I, I would like to point out, Guillermo, that uh, our chairman uh, has been uh, interfacing with NACOL. Uh, and has arranged for us to start training. 
uh, even uh, despite COVID. So that's one of the items of new business. Um, and our chairman has also uh, taken the first couple of steps on uh, trying to get our subcommittees together. So um, <laughs> I think he deserves a round of applause. Uh, and uh, we kind of agree with the direction that, that those things as being extremely important. Um, did you, I, I guess when you were in the, in the guts of, of pulling the um, authorizing ordinance and the um, bylaws together, were you, uh, well, we hear stories about, well, you guys went too far and you, you know, violated the Dillon rule. Uh, was there a lot of pushback um, in in those in that case? That's a great question. Uh, it, it's sort of a two part that I'd love to answer. Um, one is we um, we did go beyond what we were asked to do, and I will certainly admit that. One is because when when we were established as a board, the resolution specifically talked about establishing a review board. And during the course of our work, we found that a review board is sort of one part of police oversight, this complete picture of what police oversight is. And we felt during the course of our work that Charlottesville deserved oversight and not just one part of it. So we did go beyond the scope of our initial mm -hmm. just create a board and to create something that is complete, what we thought was good, honest, fair, complete oversight over the police. The other, the other sort of pushback in terms of the Dillon Rule State we did not do anything that we understood to be outside of the law. We, I'm not a lawyer, so I certainly can't speak on that sense. We spoke with John Blair on many occasions and had meetings with, with him and, and other attorneys specifically to make sure that we did not do anything that we understood to be beyond the scope of what could happen. We wanted to create a structure that could be implemented day one without laws changing, without waiting for laws change. There, there are a lot of things we wanted to do that we thought were important to do that could not be done in a Dillon rule state. And we didn't have those as, as, as part of what we presented. So as far as I know, as far as we tried, we honestly tried to present something that we thought was legal in the state of Virginia that could happen on day one. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Anybody uh, have uh, additional questions to ask, to ask Guillermo? Uh, Guillermo. Thanks for coming um, and talking to us so much. I was wondering if you could talk about um, a, uh, maybe your top two or three uh, differences that you think are, you know, that are, sorry, let me rephrase this. The, you know, I'm sure you're aware that the city council changed the, your proposal and um, we have a current proposal that's different. And I was wondering if you could talk about a couple of the important changes and um, why you think that it was a it might be important to return to the original proposal from the the initial CRB that you were on. Great, that's a good question. Thank you for that. Uh, I will say I'm doing this off the top of my head. It's been a long time since I've looked at the details of this and the last month or two of that was, was a little fuzzy. But off the top of my head, what I can think of is one of the key changes that was made was the role of the executive director that you're looking to hire and the board. We, we really wanted the executive director to be in support of the board. The board would be most of the decisions, the board would do most of the work and the director would do a lot of the um, facilitation of that work. My understanding, and, and it's been months since I've read the city's version of this, but my understanding is now most of the responsibility, the power, the weight is in the director as opposed to the board. And, and our purpose, our, our goal was always to try to make sure that the community, the citizens had the most say had the most work to do. It, it, it's, it's a big job. And, and the, we always saw the professional staff being as, as um, helping the board as opposed to the other way around. And I think the other big thing that I would mention right now in terms of differences is the community engagement aspect of it. We, that, that, that's part of, for me, the part of difference between a review board and oversight is that community engagement has to be a part of this. And, and that's part of one of the three pillars of oversight that we were looking at. And we really think that the city, the community, the review board, and the police all need to be involved in community engagement activities. Those need to be 
written down somewhere. They need to be accountable. They can't just happen when people want to put them together when they think it's important. They have to be scripted out. They have to be prescribed. So we have, uh, in what we put together, we put together a community engagement piece that included all four of those players at a certain amount of time doing a certain amount of things and then writing a certain amount of reports, which might seem a little like on the on the boring side or the not important side, but it's important to track these things and it's important to report back to the community because that's how you create a sense of transparency. And mm -hmm. from what I remember, the, the laws, the bylaws that the city passed tripped out a lot of the community engagement piece and really left it all to the board, which of course is important. You all need to be involved, but 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 the, the review board is just one part of oversight. The city has to be involved, the police have to be involved, and the community has to be involved. All four have to work on oversight together. So I think it's important to really try to get those community engagement pieces back into it. I, I have a question, James, if I could. Yeah, I just thought of one. Mm -hmm. um, Guillermo, thank you for being here tonight and, and you know putting some more uh, perspective on the background of where we've come from and, and maybe think about where we go. But I do have an opinion question. How often do you think uh, this board now should should meet with um, the kind of work that we're you know needing to do um, to support either the ED or however it, it all fleshes out? Because it sounds like when you talk about community engagement, that's a very deep, deep um, subject and, and needs a lot of, I think, eyes on it to make it successful. So in your opinion, just as someone from Charlottesville, how often do you think this board should meet? Thanks, Nancy, for the question. I think uh, I, could, I have a very easy non-COVID answer for you, but obviously everything's a little bit different and difficult with everything going on right now. I really liked our every other week schedule. And we made some arrangements as we needed to. Sometimes there were three weeks in between when, when there was a discrepancy. So, so we, we left some room for flexibility, but for us, two weeks was enough time to do a good amount of work in between the meetings and come back and, and sort of discuss and collaborate in the meetings. Like I said, most of the work that we did happened in between the sessions. And, and even like these community involvement things that we did, we try to do that, that we prescribed or sort of go beyond the scope of sort of regular meetings. Like we, we, we had a meeting, we talked a lot, we all had our assignments, we spent two weeks working on those assignments, we came back, we reported on the assignments and then we sort of uh, discussed, came back with new ones. And that two week session worked well for us. Like I said, everything's a little different with COVID and Zoom meetings and limitations. Uh, we also had meetings that weren't um, limited. Like we honestly had four and a half hours, I think was our longest meeting one night. So we had some of that it's both a, a good thing and a, it's a luxury and a pain to, to sort of have to, to, to have that flexibility. So that off the top of my head, that's, that's my answer for you, Nancy. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Hey, Guillermo, I got another one for you. When you guys were collaborating with other cities that had CRBs, uh, did you find, did you communicate with any particular one that, uh, you felt and they felt was, was really successful, uh, particularly with getting all those those different layers of buy-in that you just mentioned, the police department, the community. You know, you read a lot of different uh, material that, you know, some say, oh yeah, we have a good example, you know, uh, the CRB is working well. And then sometimes you find that, that, you know, the relationship never gets really established. Was there a good, I know Fairfax has a, uh, as a CRB, but then of course Fairfax is also, you know, 20 times, maybe maybe 50 times the size of Charlottesville, if not larger. But but did you have a good example? So I have a very unsatisfying answer for you. Um, one of the first things I learned from NACOL when I started doing this work was I asked her the exact same question very early on. I got a little bit of a laugh. And then the answer was there are 240 plus uh, review boards in the, in the country and they're all, totally different. It's very difficult to um, com compartmentalize this type of work because every city is different. Every city's background is different. Every city's population is different. Every city's um, size, money that they spend on this. Every city, every state has different governmental structures. So it's very hard to pin that down, I, th I think, to give you a clean answer. Hopefully to give you a better answer is we put together a list of, I want to, we tried to do 10. I think we ended up with about five or six boards that we thought were, had good components that we wanted to emulate. And off the top of my head, I can't remember those, but I know where they live and I'm certainly happy to get them to you. 
one thing that I will say is one thing we wanted to do with all the work that we did over that year that it was it's it was supposed to be transparent. It was for the community. So everything we did, we we created hundreds of documents in the course of our work, and they're all online and available for people to look at on the city website. Um, it can be daunting because there's so many, but I'm happy to look for that document for you, James. It won't be the best answer for you, but it'll be better than I can do off the top of my head. Well, okay, I appreciate that. And I think some of the, uh, or, or a lot of the documents that you guys uh, archived are, are available within the city website on a SharePoint. So possibly I can find, you know, some of that in there too. But um, de definitely appreciate it. Does anybody else have any more uh, questions for Guillermo? No. Okay. Well, um, if you have if you have the availability, uh, if you can just sit tight, that would be great. Um, we're moving on to a uh, a public comment section of our meeting. Uh, Brian, are, are there people in the waiting room? We do have an audience. Uh, there are about okay. 18, 18 people in the audience right now. Oh, wow. And I do want to just say, I think we have um, board member Deirdre Gilmore on the telephone. So I want to make sure she can hear us and we can hear her. Ms. Gilmore, are you able to speak to us right now? Looks like she's on yeah. mute. Oh, oh, there she goes. Great. And you can hear us okay? Yes. Excellent. So we don't have her video, but we do have her on via telephone. Um, at this time, the board is going to take public comment and hear from four speakers, each of which will get three minutes. So if you'd like to address the board, you can click the raise hand icon in the Zoom webinar. And uh, for people joining via phone, besides Ms. Gilmore, uh, you can press star nine to raise your hand as well. Uh, right now we have one hand up and that is uh, Harold Foley. And uh, let me enable him to speak. Mr. Foley, can you hear us? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, go ahead. You hey. have three minutes. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you all um, who's on this board to take care of to do this. And I really appreciate it. Um, hey, Sally. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so what I want to say is, you know, um, I was one of them community members that was pushing for a strong a civilian review board. And I think... <clears throat> The most important thing is how often y'all meet. Um, it's very important because right now, y'all are at the shaky leg moment, right? As a baby walking. And it's good to get to really um, fine tune what you're doing if you can meet every other week. That's my first suggestion. Secondly, um, Mr. Um, Chairman Watson, um, it's funny you said that Fairfax is like five times the size of Charlottesville. But the, the crazy thing is, Fairfax had the same amount of complaints as Charlottesville. And so, you know, I think <clears throat> just looking at how um, different, a different model that Fairfax is than Charlottesville, than Virginia Beach, um, to say that they still had the same amount of complaints um, as Charlottesville is just crazy. Um, in Fairfax, they got someone who you know, do the, the investigation, who does the data, like, uh, and I wish Charlottesville would understand the needs for those positions, right? The need for a good executive director who will be able to um, do the things that they need to do. Like, so I know y'all waiting for what happens in the General Assembly, but I, what I'm say, saying to you all, if it doesn't happen like you want to in the General Assembly, please continue to push for the original bylaws because they were legally binded. They didn't have anything that was um, that was un illegal about it. And so that's my, my, my pitch is more meetings. Fairfax had the same numbers as Charlottesville as complaints. And, um, and what was the third thing? I can't remember the third oh. thing, but whatever it was. The bylaws. Oh, yeah, the bylaws. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank y'all so much. And um, like I said before, I really appreciate what y'all doing. Um, it takes a lot of hard work to do this. And um, and the People's Coalition is always there. If y'all need some help with some, something, um, just let us know. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, Harold. You, Harold. 
And if you'd like to speak to the board, just click the raise hand icon in the Zoom webinar. We've got three additional spots open right now. So we've got, you're saying open spots, but nobody's raised their hand, right? Correct. At this time, no one else has raised their hand, Mr. Watson. Okay. Oh, now we have somebody. Uh oh. This is uh, Gloria Beard. Gloria, can you hear us? Okay, can y'all hear me? We can. Go ahead. Oh, well, I want to welcome everybody. This is the first time I've came to a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, on Zoom. Hello. But I just wanted to wel welcome you all. And I think this is, I was one of the original people that was on the board that wrote the battle. And I just hope this, y'all y'all just bear with this because we promised the community where they would have somebody to go to. There's a lot of people, you know, still asking, when is this boy going to get started? I said, they have started. They're waiting to <laughs> hire some more people. Imagine. So please hold on, and this 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 can be a wonderful thing for this town. So I hope you all can hang in there with us, because I might need you one day. I hope <laughs> not, but I, I might never know. Thank you all. I, that's all I have to say today. And I'll see y'all next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have another hand up. This is Tracy Hopper. Tracy, you're on with the board. Go ahead. Hi, I wanted to ask quickly, can we wait until after uh, Delegate Hudson shares to reserve our public comments or questions? Uh, Brian, unless there's uh, some kind of logistical issue with that, if folks want to, you know, hear what Ms. Hudson has to say, and then, you know, a couple people want to do that later, that's fine with me. No, it's up to you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so the, we would then take two spots, leave the two spots remaining for after Delegate Hudson's update. Sounds good to me. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. May I make a comment on what Mr. Foley said while we move forward? Is that possible, uh, yes, Chairman? I just want to remind us that we took a vote in June. It, it now is almost you know 90 days later that we took a vote in June about how we felt between um, the bylaws and ordinance that we're working under now and the bylaws and ordinance that the original board um, recommended, and you know still waiting to see what the special session um, happens. But we do have a voice in how we felt about um, our operational uh, logistics. So I just wanted to you know keep that. <laughs> Um, in, uh, in our mind as we move forward. Hey, Nancy, I was going to suggest, I don't I was going to wait. I don't know if there's a better time later, but I was holding out um, that maybe we talk about in between this meeting and next meeting, writing uh, a letter to remind the city that we're still waiting on that. We're still waiting, you know, that we reiterate our requests, that we're still waiting to hear their promise to, I mean, the mayor literally promised on, on the, on a meet, at a meeting to give us written explanations about the changes they made. We still haven't gotten those. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a few more things too. I was thinking that perhaps we just, I don't know if it's going to do anything, but we need to send a reminder because we're still waiting on quite, basically everything we've done and asked for, the city has not re really responded to. So I think. It was just going to be something I suggest later, but I'll just have done that, do that now. All right. So I'm ready to move on to uh, Delegate Sally Hudson and uh, interview our representative and, and get some feedback. Um, Ms. Hudson, can you uh, introduce yourself to the, to the group? Absolutely. So my name is Sally Hudson, and I serve the 57th district in the House of Delegates, which is all of the city of Charlottesville, and then two big hunks of the county, um, up 29 to the Ravana, uh, and then down south, um, about the Mill Creek area, um, collectively about 80,000 people, so 50,000 city, about 30,000 county. 
Um, and we are in the middle of a special session right now, which I know um, has a lot to do with the work that you have set in motion. So first, let me start by thanking you, both all the current CRB members and then all the former CRB members, Guillermo, Ms. Beard, everyone who pushed this work forward. You know, when we're talking about it in Richmond, um, or at least remotely now <laughs> in Richmond, uh, that uh, Charlottesville is always on, on everyone's lips. We're talking about Charlottesville as one of those communities that is, is really pushing the boundaries in Virginia. So I know it can feel frustrating at times here as though things aren't going far enough, fast enough, but you really are setting the pace for the rest of the Commonwealth and you deserve enormous thanks for that. Um, maybe what I can do, if it's all right by you, Mr. Chairman, is um, sort of summarize the state of the bills and then take any questions that you might have. Yeah, that sounds excellent. Thank you. Okay. So as in most things, there is, for the, the CRB matter, there is a House version of the bill and a Senate version of the bill. And those things have been in motion now for many weeks, and, and you may have heard about different pieces of them. So maybe let me start by telling you the pieces that have come together where the drafts are now aligned, um, thanks in large part to the work by a lot of the advocates here in Charlottesville, people like Sarah Burke. Um, right now, the current drafts that have come out of both chambers um, include things like binding disciplinary authority, which I know was a priority for this board, subpoena power, um, the, the right to independent legal counsel, which I know is important for you in order to do your job in an informed way, um, and then also the right to review budget and expenditure records for the police departments, which are so critical for advising thoughtfully on policy. So those are the, the big pieces that have come together. There's still a little daylight between the two drafts on two major fronts. Um, the version that came out of the House includes sheriffs, which is something that was not super important to this community um, because in Charlottesville, the sheriff has a relatively limited role in law enforcement. Our sheriff serves legal papers and in, is involved in inmate transportation, some patient transportation, provides security at the courts. Um, but there are lots of other communities in Virginia where the sheriff is really the, the head of law enforcement. In 86 of Virginia counties, um, of Virginia's 133 counties, um, there are, they're wholly policed by the sheriff. Um, and so it was important for the House um, to start to stake out that ground and say that, that this would also be relevant for sheriffs who are the primary source of law enforcement in a lot of Virginia communities. Um, so the House version has that, the Senate version doesn't. It's not particularly relevant to your work, but it's one of the ways where there's some distance between them. And then the other piece is that the House version also mandates the creation of a CRB, whereas the Senate version enables it. So again, that's not particularly relevant here in Charlottesville because we already have um, a CRB in motion. So whether um, either of those, those comes to pass, I don't think that'll have a lot of bearing on you, but it, it will start to set the tone for other communities. Um, I think it's still very much an open debate how, whether or not the, the mandate is the best step forward. Um, on the one hand, I think all of us want there to be empowered civilian review of law enforcement in every corner of the Commonwealth. I think on the other hand, there are questions about whether mandating it right here, right now might force some communities to put together something in a scrappy fashion that wouldn't go through the same thorough process that you have and, and be built from the ground up by the communities. So that is, is still an open discussion. Um, but for the purposes of your board, I don't think either of those differences will matter a bunch, um, either the sheriff piece um, or the mandate. Uh, so those are kind of the, the big pieces. I am, would be happy to take any questions about what else is on the board or, or talk about anything else on your mind. Just a uh, quick thought, I see Bill's hand. Just uh, make the statement I'm, I'm very optimistic since both the House and the Senate, even though their bills, you know, are a little bit different. The fact that they both have bills that um, at least give authorization, right, to uh, civilian review boards to even exist, that's, that, that is a very good thing because, you know, between the two, I think the, uh, the, the Senate bill is, uh, well, the House bill is a little stronger because it does mandate, right? And as you said, we're not worried about them mandating them everywhere because, well, we already have one. But I think if worst case scenario, uh, Senate Bill 5035 
if that is authorized, that will that can enable the way for us to go back to the old bylaws or new bylaws. And um, when I say new bylaws, um, they're even talking about uh, subpoena power, uh, you know, disciplinary determinations, a bunch of different things that weren't even in the original bylaws. So it just seems like at the bare minimum, we're going to end up at some point, probably this uh, this calendar year, possibly or early 2021 with with uh, a lot more of a strong platform for for all things CRB. So I'm I'm very uh, very optimistic about that. I think that's spot on. I think the floor is pretty good at this point. I would be shocked if we got out of this special session without a CRB bill that that has those things that we just discussed. Yeah, if I, if I could ask now, I, I, my impression is that it's more likely that the uh, enabling part is going to pass rather than the mandate part. Um, and it seems to me then that we here in Charlottesville would then be in a position of having to, I won't say we, I would say the city council of having to revise our enabling ordinance to allow those specific powers, subpoena, disciplinary action, uh, and whatever. Uh, and it's going to be then up to the council as to what powers they give us. Um, do you think that's, that's a likely scenario? Um, you know, I would ask our, our city attorney, John Blair, if he might step in and, and consult here because he knows the matters of the city ordinance better than I do. Um, I, I do believe it is the case I, that I think it's slightly more likely that the Senate version will be what makes it out. But as to the specifics of what that entails um, for revising your ordinances, I would defer to our city attorney. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Delegate Hudson, for all your work for for our area first. Um, but to answer the question, um, Mr. Mendez, you're correct. Most of the Senate bill is still dependent on the city council enacting the, uh, the powers that would be provided through the enabling legislation. Um, and, and again, like you stated, that would be still up to the city council to enable or to adopt those powers that are enabled by the state. So we could end up with subpoena power, but not disciplinary power, or neither, uh, or some combination. I think we should just all be aware uh, that it, it is possible that we will have to we'll have to lobby the city council fairly hard for every every power that we want. That is true, Bill. But the good thing is, those powers can no longer be challenged. As legal. That's that's correct. That's good. Yeah, it's not like it's not like the the city council is going to have the, um, I guess the concern uh, that uh, this is violating state law. So, yeah, in some ways, you can think of enabling legislation like granting home field advantage. At least you get to to bring the ball back and have that battle on your own turf. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, does anybody on the board have any uh, questions for Ms. Hudson? We can, uh, uh, Mr. Wheeler, we can reach out to the, uh, to, the, to the folks who may have questions from the public. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Um, we still have Tracy Hopper's hand up. If anyone else would like to address the board, they can click the raise hand icon in the Zoom webinar. And, um, Tracy, did you just lower your hand? It looks like she had it up and then lowered it. Uh, Mr. Foley has his hand up again, but he has already spoken during this part of the meeting, Mr. Watson. Um, that said, there's no other hand raised. So I'll leave that up to you. Uh, yeah, if, Har if Harold would like to speak, uh, I I'd like, like to hear what he's got to say. Mr. Foley, you're back on with the CRB. Go ahead. I feel like E.F. Hutton. <laughs> That's an old, that's an old uh, commercial folks don't know about it. Um, what I wanted to say is, um, far as 
community environment, we got y'all back because the community been wanting to have subpoena power, discipline power, and power to investigate in the whole nine. So uh, the People's Coalition definitely going to fight that battle for you um, in city council. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Harold. And right now, there are no other hands raised, Mr. Watson. Okay, real quick, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on um, my, my good buddy down there, uh, Mr. Brown. I feel like you might have some thoughts, something you want to say. So don't don't. I know you're not shy, but don't don't feel shy. You know, being new. <laughs> um, if, if you got anything you'd like to uh, to add. No, I'm just uh, listening at this point. I mean, I followed. Um, both the House and Senate bills, and you know, I'm pretty familiar with the space. Um, it's, uh, I don't think a lot of this is um, new to me based on what I had um, um, learned while running. So, you know, at this point, I'm just listening, but have no fear. I will speak up uh, if I have something. All right. There, there's one bill that I was uh, uh, reading about that passed uh, the House. And that was the uh, Bill 5099, the No Knock Warrant, which uh, you know is obviously uh, uh, very significant. Um, I'll be following along to see see where that goes. Um, there really are a host of host of different bills that um, seem pretty promising, you know, mixed in with with all the other things that they're trying to do, with uh, also getting the budget back in order. Um, Ms. Hudson, a little off topic, but you're an economist. You're also teaching at UVA, and uh, that's got to be kind of an interesting phenomenon right now with uh, coronavirus and then trying to figure out how to how to work the budget back for the state of Virginia. Um, just real quick, slightly off topic, but could, could you give us a little, you know, what, what's that whole process like being a delegate teaching at UVA and trying to figure out some of this, uh, this budget shortfall that, that coronavirus has created? Well, I can tell you, I've been standing in this spot in my kitchen on Zoom since 9 a.m. <laughs> uh, oh. uh, I, 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 uh, I teach from 9 to 3, and then we hopped on the floor session, which is also remote, come um, because we're doing our part to meet remotely, too, with the legislature, um, and then had a chance to join you. So it's all, it's all me right here on this camera, regardless of what we're doing. Um, but uh, yeah, let me say that um, I think that as an economist, maybe I bring a perspective to uh, some of our budget negotiations that it isn't always so widely shared in Richmond. Um, I think that uh, a lot of things have shifted in Richmond in the last couple years, um, in part due to the turnover and leadership. Um, but I, I think that we still have a relatively um, conservative, small C conservative attitude um, about a lot of fiscal measures. Um, and I think that there's sort of a, a default assumption uh, right now in Richmond about the budget, which is that COVID has obviously created an enormous shortfall in state revenue um, and the federal government has not stepped up to the level that we'd like to help us fill that. Um, and I think that there's a, a natural inclination to austerity in Richmond to say, okay, well, the only thing that we can do in response to that budget hole is cut programs to the bone um, and, and not uh, fund our schools and, and fund some of those mental health initiatives that we'd like to, a lot of things that have been on the back burner for a long time. Uh, I, I think we have more tools on the table than we're necessarily using. I think we've got more than a billion dollars in a rainy day fund, which could be using, we could be using right now to be a bridge um, and be providing more proactive rent relief and um, hazard pay for workers. And then we could come back with a charge uh, in our next session in Richmond to do some really serious revenue reform um, because there are a lot of a lot of things we could be doing to modernize our tax code in Virginia to pull in more revenue from some of the winners of the COVID crisis. You know, there have been people who have been making money during this period. You know, big multi-state corporations and online retailers, and you know, there there are people right now who are not paying their fair share of revenue back to Virginia. And I, I think that we should be considering those options. Um, that that attitude doesn't always. Um, get a lot of bites in Richmond, um, but it is definitely a voice that I bring to the table. Um, I think there are some folks who treat revenue like rainfall, like it's just an act of God, um, and we have to deal with whatever comes in the door. Um, and I think revenue is a choice that we make, um, you know, when we put our money where our mouth is and we invest in things that matter. And so I, I would really like us 
um, to be a little bit more creative about what we can be doing, because the reality is the state has not been picking up its fair share of a lot of critical public services for far too long. We've been putting too much on our localities. Um, and so that's a long answer to a short question. Um, but let's suffice it to say, um, I think I got a lot of thoughts about what we could be doing with the budget. All right, great. Are, are there any um, any additional questions for Delegate Hudson? I, I know we, we probably need to let her uh, get comfy and cozy. And you, you say you've been on the <laughs> Zoom for pretty much all day. So um, thank you for your service to the Commonwealth and, uh, and, and, and trying to figure out how to teach those, uh, those, those UVA students from afar, too. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank, thank you. you. And let me say, um, if I can, before I scatter, um, please be in touch as you all encounter, um, you know, the, the challenges ahead of you. You really are running into walls on behalf of a lot of people. And so when you hit them, let me know, because it's our job to clear paths for you in Richmond. And I just, I hope we can um, do all of that with the kind of urgent grace that it demands. Um, you know, keep our foot on the pedal, but also recognize that there will be growing pains. Um, and you know, when we hit we hit those walls, um, you know, continue to be good communicators and and uh, keep in touch so that we can get you the authority that you need to do your job well. Because I know that you're carrying a charge on a lot of people, a lot for a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. All right. Hey everybody. Uh, let's see. We are moving to our pending business section of our meeting. Um, status of complaints. So for folks, uh, folks, folks from the public, uh, one of the primary tasks of the civilian uh, review board is to uh, intake complaints from the public. Um, <clears throat> the uh, people who submit complaints can choose to submit them directly to us or they can be, uh, they can be um, sent directly to the police department and then they can, they can sort of opt to have those uh, complaints sent to us. So our, we began our tenure on, I believe it was June 29th. And since that time we received six complaints. Uh, in this meeting, I'm, un, I'm unable to really uh, discuss the details of each one of the cases because they're they're under uh, internal affairs uh, review right now, but we, we have received six of them, and um, the police department has uh, internal affairs office has 75 days in order to uh, review each case, and then uh, you know basically provide the the results their findings back to the uh, the complainant and us. And we do have, today is uh, September 10th. We do have one that we're anticipating hearing back from uh, by uh, September 22nd. We've got uh, five other ones and, you know, I'll, I'll say the dates. It's, I was kind of wondering about this section because I can't really, you know, give details of each one again because they're under investigation. But I will say um, I saw the video um, that the mayor did and the uh, police chief about a week ago. And, you know, there was a time in Charlottesville apparently where cases where uh, people would submit complaints and the com complaints would be outstanding for two years. And, uh, you know, nobody was following through. So I, I do think that there's some general improvement that is happening. And I think we're adding a, another layer of, of defense and oversight and, um, you know, we're just getting started, but uh, with these complaints that are coming through, you know, the, uh, the uh, police force has to be thorough in their investigation because we're here, right? And then there's other people that are here, like the People's Coalition and uh, the many people that have attended our meetings and, and the uh, city council meetings. So I, I do think that is one, I think one tangibly, again, the, uh, the, the city is improving the police department and how they sort of, uh, you know, take action on these complaints. And then again, we're adding that, that next layer. Um, but, you know, I'm not really, again, at will to really 
discuss any of those, but I will say that um, we're, get, we're receiving them and the city has had at least one that somebody submitted to the city uh, police department that they handed over to us also so that we were, we were aware of it. So I thought that that was, that was a, good, uh, a good act in being tra transparent. Um, anybody have any questions? No, Stuart looked like he's brewing down there with something. I was just going to add a couple things, if it's okay, because um, James has asked me to kind of, sure. we don't have an executive director to just process these, you know, complaints and send them, basically forward them onto the the CPD if they meet the criteria, you know, there's supposed to be some basic information that's in each complaint. Um, I've had one case where it followed up and asked for more and I didn't get it. So I sent it along and thus far the police have or the CPD has not asked for more, you know, push back on that. Um, I just want to note that to the extent that um, if one of these complaints that um, internal affairs reviews, um, if they find that the complaint is sustained and then they therefore uh, dole out some kind of punishment or whatever their process is after that, um, the board won't find out any details about that. That was one of the changes that was made. Uh, from the initial proposal bylaws to now to the current it bylaws is that um, under the original ones we could have found out about that and then um, assessed whether or not or someone could have filed a complaint that the that the sort of the discipline didn't fit the the, the crime if you will um, whether the, the dis the discipline to the officer wasn't proportionate to the incident involved so we won't find out about those at all if, if they say if they find that something sustained that the complaint was valid and that they they give some sort of discipline if we do, if they find it, if there's any other kind of finding, we'll find out about it and we're supposed to get an investigation report um, from CPD and that's what the 75 de day deadline is for. Um, and I'll be frank, I mean, I've, I've spoken to Mr. Blair about this briefly, is that there's no definition of an investigation report. Um, I'm not gonna hold my breath. I, I, I'm hopeful that it's, that it's gonna be something that's multi-paged, but technically <laughs> under the letter of the law, Right now, the letter of the ordinance, the police CPD could send us something that's two or three sentences long. So we'll see how that works out. And maybe if we're just satisfied with the result, we can work on changing that or asking for, for more details in the future. Um, but I just wanted to sort of clarify some of those things for people um, and you know, people who might be listening to, because it's not super easy to just read through all these things and and, and get and get that from the ordinance because because the way it's written. Does anybody on the board have uh, questions about complaints, status of complaints? Uh oh. What? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I had to look. Um, uh -huh. No, I'm just going to, you know, I, I, I'm going to reserve how well CPD is doing for a little while longer um, yeah. just to see how transparent they are because we are only uh, been, been around like 90 days or so, you know, thanks to the pandemic. Um, and so I'm going to give, you know, find out how they um, respond to the uh, documentation that we've sent over uh, on the spreadsheet and uh, really see what they send us um, to really gauge for myself, speaking only for myself, um, as to how well I think they are interested in being more transparent to the community. You know, Nancy, that was the other thing. I knew there was one more thing is that <laughs> James praised them for being transparent with uh, allowing the dual filing. Essentially, if you file directly with them to send it to us, uh, that's required under the ordinance. So uh, I, I would say that it's great that they're already doing that. But uh, beyond that, I would say it's a, it's a, like a magnanimous gesture that they're required to, <laughs> just to point that out. And uh, we have half of the complaints we've got are thus far, half of the six are dual filed. So someone went directly to CPD and elected to send it to us as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Any more Discussion about complaints. Philip Philip's got his red shirt on and his sporting coat, sporting jacket, looking sharp. Sound like you, you you still at work? Yes. Like you got a file cabinet behind you or something. All right, so you've got the status of CRB requests for information. Uh, one thing I want to do 
when we're when we're asking the police department for uh, data, so that we're not asking them for a bunch of different uh, scatters of data throughout a month. What I like to do is streamline that process. And so, if there's something we want to find out, right, like you know how they're spending money, uh, what types of equipment. You know they're using those types of things. Um, like like recently, I'm 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 kind of curious about uh, some of the demographics, right, of the police force. You know, I would I would love to see uh, more recruiting, right, of uh, of of African American police officers. Right now, I think there's nine on the force. I think there's no female African American officers at all. You know, and I'm not blaming anybody at all. You know, this is I think this is a point of we can collaborate. Hey, let's help you figure out how to recruit, right? Um, there's there's probably some talent out there. You know, I, I think Charlottesville is a great place to live. And um, it, it is expensive. I've, I've spent a lot of time in my in my life working with the military. Um, I know Charlottesville has different takes on, on military, but there are so many people who get out of the, the service um, in, in our state that are looking for a job and uh, of color. And, and we could have a direct pipeline, you know, if we, um, you know, find a way to sort of connect with some of those vets. And um, I think, uh, you know, if we want to sort of bridge some of these gaps and and in business as usual, you got to have a police force that's uh, diverse, right? And you know, I'm not blaming anybody, uh, but I think, you know, one of the, one of the you know, we talk a lot about bylaws and things like that, but, you know, one of the, one of the things that makes us better is uh, coming up with solutions that are tangible, and um, and so anyway, we, we, I was I was talking about that because it'd be interesting to, to see. I haven't sent a data request, but what is the uh, you know what is the makeup of the forts, right? What you know, um, you know, if we're all if we're very homogenous, and half of the people are driving in from Augusta County now, you know, they're, they're not they're not living in the neighborhoods. Now, granted, Charlottesville is expensive, right? So, um, uh, police salary doesn't necessarily uh, get you a house in Charlottesville anymore. But, you know, again, with my sort of idea I'm thinking about with Mets, a lot of them come out in the military with a retirement check and a GI Bill, which makes it easier to buy a home in Charlottesville. And they're used to living in all types of places, you know, Korea, Japan, Hawaii, Missouri. So it's, it's just, just kind of a thought. So that's one of the requests. But uh, we have this on here. Did anybody, uh, Stuart, did you ask for quite a few items? Um, what did, did you get all the things that you were looking for with those requests? Well, uh, so thanks, thanks, uh, James. I think it's a good idea to streamline it. Um, I think, uh, so I'll just point out that we all did vote on it. I don't want to make it just seem like it's me and personal, although I've been communicating with them because I didn't find the city's responses to be complete in my opinion and I, I kind of wrote back about why um, also I don't really want to go down this path because it's so complicated and I think unnecessarily so but the city decided to treat our request as a FOIA request um, and then which I, I later spoke to Mr. Blair about and understood that you you know as because we're essentially part of the city we can't really FOIA ourselves right so but and then in electing to do that, the city used, then voluntarily electing to consider our request, a FOIA request, the city decided to use FOIA as an excuse not to give us some information under the request. They said, well, we don't have to create any new documents because it's under FOIA. We only have to give current documents. So I found that whole experience very frustrating um, with them. I think there, there's some missing information um, in like the inventory we asked for, some, some pretty short responses to the questions we asked. I think it might be, I was going to suggest that it might be good to like regroup um, and come up with, you know, a collective thing um, with one of the, one of the uh, subcommittees could be part of, you know, like we have this, this, we're charged with one of the things that we can do is make policy recommendations. And that's how I saw, saw these, uh, these requ requests is like beginning the process of gathering information because I don't think we can make a policy recommendation unless we learn more about the department, how much, you know, basic things, how much money are they spending, what what they have, how the officers spend their time, all sorts of stuff like that, right? Um, and so I think we want to, I think it might be good to do one of the, 
that each meeting we we can vote on more requests or once a quarter and try to come up with a way to gather this information from the city although i'm not positive we really have any like authority to press them for this information we can just ask uh, well, so that, one, that's what i'll say one is, quick question to you mm -hmm. uh the the request i mean i get asking for data right because you know people are talking about reimagining defunding and you know we want to know how much money is is being spent on certain things and where, you know, potentially that could be allocated if, if that's the way to go. But you were asking the one question about um, how, how the officers are spending their time. Mm -hmm. But what were you uh, kind of, what was your thought process with wanting to know how they spend their time? Well, um, I, my personal thought process, and I don't know what other people thought when they, when they voted for that request uh, is that, is that, you know, Fit the the CPD's budget is about eighteen million dollars, and you know, give or take. And my understanding is about fifteen million dollars of that. So a huge percentage is police salaries. And I guess you know, if you have a job, whether it's a giant, a, a bigger corporation like Citibank or something, or even a small place, you know, your employer tends to know what you do all day, and and may, they might track it, they might not, but they want to understand what they're getting for their salary. And I wanted to understand how police officers are spending their time on the clock. Um, and if the if CPD knows, because I've read articles that have come out since uh, the unfortunate death of Mr. Floyd about police reform and saying that, you know, that on average in, in other jurisdictions, police officers spend about only four to six percent of their time responding to violent crime. And the, a lot of the other times are traffic stops, which we know tend to be disproportionate or other kinds of stops. And so I guess my thought is we, I want to understand what we're paying for, you know, and perhaps a recommendation from the board down the way, the, down the way would be like, let's reallocate those sums, not necessarily get rid of those people. But um, I just want to, if this, if CPE doesn't even know, if they're not tracking how the officers spend their time on their shift, who does? So that's, that's my question. And I don't think it's, on, I mean, maybe it's just the attorney in me where I used to have to keep track of my time by every six minutes, <laughs> but I don't think it's that unusual to, to like track your day, right? You know, I mean, it sucks, but a lot of things suck about work. That's why they call it work, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, makes sense. And I mean, if you're, if you're on the beat on a downtown mall, you're spending your time, uh, you know, patrolling the mall, making sure things are going smooth, hopefully talking to people, uh, you know, I mean, you're, I you're so, on the beat. You're on the beat. I hope so. And I'm not saying they have to do some sort of like busy work. What I'm saying is that when I asked if CPD tracks it, when we asked that, they the one word answer we got was N O, no. So they're saying they don't they don't track that. And they didn't, you know, so it doesn't even sound like to me that CPD knows if their officers on the beat or what's going on. I mean, based on their answer. Uh, again, I, I don't, I'm just, I just asked right. a simple question and they came back with that simple answer. And I just think it's a little weird that as an employer, you wouldn't know how you, all of your employees are spending their time. Anybody got any, uh, any, any comments? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, yeah. And looking, you know, getting prepped for all this and looking through NACOL and everything else. Um, and, you know, having, uh, how the steward has said that he's had experience as an attorney, I um, have not found in that space where a concern about tracking time um, is something that necessarily aligns. I think uh, when, with the definition of oversight, it's about investigating audits, reviews, and you know some of those other things that are um, related to having your, your constitutional rights violated and things like that. I think if we're getting to a point of where we're looking to um, micromanage in six, six minute increments, I think that's very different. Also, with regard to, um, in my own research diligence, looking across uh, the country, a lot of police departments have significantly um, uh, that proportion of expenses spent on officers is, is significantly high due to um, the nature of the industry itself. I think you can find some commonalities in other industries as well. Um, I don't want to, again, you know, I come to this from a background of, I know personally within the Commonwealth, I've had my constitutional rights violated. And I want to ensure that other folk who come after me have that focus in mind. I don't necessarily um, want, you know, 
from my perspective, want to get in the weeds. And I think that if you're talking about operational things like that, that does come uh, from council's purview or, or the city manager's purview. Um, I really uh, would like to look at this, this oversight perspective from our community members' constitutional rights being violated and some of those other things that are, that are aching to that as opposed to, you know, can we control um, the dollars of CPD? I think that's a purview of the city council itself um, as opposed to us. Okay, I'd like to respond back to what Stuart said. I, I think it's not, to me, it's not necessarily one of nickel and dime the CPD department. It's wanting to know what, the, you know, that they can't even tell city council what taxpayer dollars are being spent on right now. I, you know, they, the most, a lot of times with these salaries um, and some of these other incidentals, it's, it's based on overtime because there are, you know, a lack of, of personnel, but I think that also can be ameliorated by um, reconfiguring what law enforcement is really about in this community, which is what, you know, our oversight is about. When you talk about policy, yes, there is something in our bylaws that talks about um, being made aware of policies that will change and, and having a look-see at, at that. And, and I don't think it's... Um, overreach on our part to kind of want to understand like you know where where are you spending your time are you doing your are you spending your time ty typing up larceny reports or robbery reports where nothing is ever going to be found or done and you just put it in a database somewhere and then you use that to say oh look you know we now have a larger uh crime rate because we have all these unsolved you know um larcenies and robberies and things like that you know that and the constitutional part is part of it, but I think that, you know, if we're going to do right by the community, we can, I feel like we kind of need to understand some of some of this a little bit, you know, a deeper dive um, on, on some of these things. At least that's my interpretation, you know, um, of from what I heard, you know, over the last um, couple of years since the, you know, summer of 2017 and, and, and listening to what everybody has said throughout a lot of meetings that folks um, have gone to. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to yeah, say, too, if, one, oh, go yeah. ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thanks. That's okay. <laughs> or you directly yeah, um, you. yeah, I've just, you know, I haven't said a whole lot because I just, I'm just listening and trying to understand a lot. But, you know, when it comes to the CPD, um, I, I want to know exactly, you know, I want to know how it works. I want to know what they do from beginning to end from on their day. And I'm not concerned about, you know, I, I don't want to hear anything about the money. I just want to know what they do from the time they get to work until the time they leave. What are we paying for? Because our tax dollars are paying. Them. So I want to know how it works. And, and it shouldn't be that big of a deal to, to, to say, to tell us why I'm so sick and tired of everything being made out to be a big deal when it doesn't have to be. And as long as this continue, we're not gonna get anything accomplished. So um, I, I'm all for trying to find out. I wanna know what is their day? How does it work? What are they, what are they getting paid for from the time they come to work? When, if they don't run into a real bad situation. And so what do they do in between when it's not a, a horrible situation occurring? What goes, what happens? They eat donuts. <laughs> so I'm I just, just want to know, and I'm, not asking, and I'm not asking to be mean. I'm not asking to be, not trying to disrespect anybody's position or none of that. But everybody who work have to be held accountable accountable for the time that they are on that clock. So what, what do they do for the eight hours that they are there? Eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever it be. It's a, it's a, it's a very can, legitimate question. It's a legitimate question. Yeah, I, I, one thing I want to point out again is um, that in the original, I think both sets of bylaws contemplated that within a few months of our being uh, sworn in, uh, that we would have training and we would have training not only from NACOL, but we would have training from the city manager 
uh, representatives of the police department. And we could have asked, and, and under ordinary circumstances, we could have asked those questions directly, face to face. And if we didn't like the answer, then, then we could complain. Uh, in terms of the, the, the data request that we made, we got 17 big spreadsheets. Uh, I haven't gone through all the information in those 17 big spreadsheets. And so I'm certainly not uh, qualified to make a decision you know, about what is the most important and, and you know, what is, what's there and what isn't. Uh, you know, the only thing that struck me was how little was being trained, uh, spent on training. Um, you know, but then I might have been looking at the wrong. Mm -mm. I think he, I think um, he froze up. Oh. He froze up. And, uh, you know. He's doing pretty good today. Yeah, though. There's a whole <laughs> Uh, I just want to say, so, anyway. things. oh, sorry, I, I, I thought Bill was, I'm sorry. <laughs> nope. It's hard with the choppy internet. Um, that one, you know, we've already voted on this and we asked the question, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. we got the answer. It's okay. I don't want to be in the business of managing the police. I mean, being I a manager, I try to. super fun. Right. Uh, I, I do understand that we have a narrow, we have a somewhat narrow focus as a board based on the three main missions set out, set out in the bylaws. I do think the policy recommendation part is open to a broad interpretation if we want to take it. Um, I just think that, you know, like people have said is we haven't really, we don't know, what we, were, we need some training. We need some, I mean, I think the chief has said that. And, I, you know, I reached out to the chief before we had our first meeting and I asked if we could meet and she said, she turned me down and said she'd meet us when we were bored together. Um, we, she still, she's come to our meetings, but she's sort of hung out and not really talked to us. But, and it doesn't have to be the chief. I'm sure she's busy, but I think we could stand to learn more about the department. And that's why I started asking the questions in writing. And I think it's a good thing to, um, to think about doing down the road if we all have uh, questions that we wanna vote on as a majority and, and the board and, and ask some questions and find that out. But I think that we don't, I mean, you know, my goal here is I don't, I don't wish the, the six minute thing upon anyone. I'm not saying it's a good system or anything like that. It's some crazy Nilo liberalism to me, you know, but like it, no one wants to do that. I just want to ask like, what's going on? How do you guys work? Things like that. Because, you know, one of the criticisms, criticisms we get is we don't know. So we got to find out somehow. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I'll say that I think it'd be a good subcommittee. If there's like a policy recommendation subcommittee, they could be, charged with also being in charge of any requ requests or proposals and you know people from the the board as well as the community can make these suggestions like it's a it, we're an opportunity to be a conduit for people uh, just say you know to get ideas from the very community we're supposed to be looking out for can i ask a question why certainly <laughs> okay i keep hearing about this training that we need um so are, are we to expect that we will not get any um, cooperation or any help or assistance from the police until we get this from the um, CPD or the chief actually, until well, we get this training? Ms. Johnson. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, what I did over the last couple of weeks uh -huh. is um, I, I looked into you know how we can do training because Nicole has a few different things they normally do and and due to the pandemic they've they've put their training uh, videos on online mm -hmm. so this week I got us signed up um, to be able to do the training I was going to talk talk about that later on um, so we can take classes we'll have a login and you can you can take those at any time. Um, the, the goal is for us to each take six classes before the end of this year. So by the end of December, because we're mm -hmm. supposed to have uh, eight hours mm -hmm. of training mm -hmm. um, based on the ordinance. Mm. And then we'll have uh, with our with our Nicole membership, we'll have access to 32 classes. But we'll um, we can start taking those. We, did, we just got this in the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. I think the prior group, as Guillermo, Guillermo explain, explained earlier, had uh, Nicole actually come to uh, Charlottesville. Mm. And they were able to do a little bit of one-on-one. -on -one. And there he just popped back up. He, he can talk about that. 
Okay. If so can I got, I got another question? Yeah, okay. I got another question. Yep. <laughs> okay. So we <laughs> so we get all this training, take all these classes, and that's us for our training. So what type of training is is the CPD doing for those police officers? What's that's in good... place for them? What's in place for them? And they expect it's the expectation of this board to have all this training. I haven't heard not nothing about what type of training the CPD is going to take on special training or extra training for those police officers that are currently employed there. Just asking, not trying to start a confusion. <laughs> I'm just asking a question. Oh, that, that, that is a valuable question. And I think what we need to do either in our, in our next meeting or the one after that is, is invite the chief, right? Mm -hmm. And we can, we can write down 10 to 15 questions like Stuart said, hey, how did, how did the officer spend their day, mm -hmm. right? And we can, we can provide her those questions beforehand so that mm -hmm. it just moves smoothly through Zoom. Um, what kind of training? I think they had a de-escalation training early in the summer because um, I saw something on Facebook about it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, are they, are they having diversity training, de-escalation training? Mm -hmm. um, again, my, my question is about recruiting, right? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can't have but not you can't know nine black officers. I'm not, I'm not again. I'm not blaming anybody, but we can, we can we can probably help them do better, right? I'm not here just to complain. I want officer solutions too. Mm -hmm. so, and how many um, actually? And how many actually live in Charlottesville? <laughs> right. Yeah, that would be that would be good information to know. But yeah, I think what we need to do is work on coming up with a list of questions that are tangible and, 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 the, and the police chief will meet with us and uh, she'll answer those questions. And that way, even though we need data, we're just not, you know, hey, how many of these do you have and how many of those do you have? Mm -hmm. But we're actually also putting some, you know, reasoning, at least from her step. I had a conversation with her and, you know, it'll, it'll give her a better understanding of, of why we're asking for things. And I mean, nowadays, you know, conversations are rare in general, we're stuck in Zoom, social distancing. So I really think we just need to invite her to a meeting and again, be ready with those questions ahead of time. So we're not looking through spreadsheets, trying to figure out why Officer Thompson, you know, what is he, he or she, you know, doing during our day? We'll just get it right from the, right from the source. Yeah, that would be good because yes, it's so much back and forth and so much he say, she say now. Right. And I'm just really quite tired of the he say, she say. So if we can get direct answers, <laughs> you know, that, that would be a great big help because all of this back and forth is, is just prolonging us from not doing what we need to have done. All right, so we got 30 minutes from tracking correctly. We got 30 minutes. Let me see my. And we got 29 minutes to get through quite a few items, guys and girls. Um, next thing on our agenda is the executive director job description. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, are you able to, to display that? We uh, there was some back and forth with I guess the finalizing the drafting of it. And um, yeah, we did not, we, did we, not want, make we would like the announcement. Yeah, this looks like the announcement. Okay, good. I've got both the announcement and the job description. You can tell me which one you want to talk about. Real quick, uh, can all folks see this uh, mm -hmm. on Zoom and on and on people on Facebook and all that? Can they see this? I can see it. Yeah. Now we sent this around, and I apologize if there was some confusion. Um, do you remember that at the last meeting, we proposed a draft, which was very different from what the city had originally proposed. Uh, and we voted last meeting to submit what we had done to the city manager and uh, the HR department and get them to respond and see uh, you know, what they did. What they basically did was gave us almost all of what we wanted. 
the first three sections of the job announcement uh, are almost all written by us uh, with very few exceptions. Um, they have uh, importantly added the um, introductory chapter, uh, introductory paragraph right at the beginning that tells you know what what our city is like uh, and you know why people would want to come here. Uh, a summary of the uh, the second paragraph is you know pretty much uh, the same as we asked for. Uh, the third paragraph explains the salary. Uh, the essential responsibilities and duties are a mixture of things that were provided by us and by the city manager. Um, and I think that some of the most important changes that were made were the education experience and skills in which they agreed that uh, these uh, requirements should be much broader. It should just be public administration or criminal justice people that they're looking for, but it could also be people with experience in national policing, civilian oversight, and social justice. Um, and beyond that, uh, you know, again, you've, you've, even if briefly you've, you've seen the rest of the document, uh, the last couple of sections are uh, sort of administrative paragraphs that are kind of required. Uh, and I think that they're not, yes, they're going to be doing light work. That's not a big deal. We don't need to worry too much about that. Um, so the uh, city manager has said, if we agree to this uh, document, see of the uh, city jobs website tomorrow, uh, and we'll send it to the NACOL job postings tomorrow. Uh, and I think that would be, you know, given that we need to move forward, I think that would be a very good thing to do. Uh, I don't know, does anybody have any questions about the changes or, or whatever? Uh, I have a question I noticed. I mean, it's pretty minor uh, um, going through essential responsibilities and duties. Uh, I believe it's bullet point three, uh, Charlottesville Polite Department. Um, so you can fix that. Yeah. yeah, but other than that, uh, I don't have anything. Uh, Bill, Got it. I noticed yeah. that the salary range on the job announcement was quite a bit higher than the one, or sorry, the, the salary range on the job description was quite a bit higher. It was, it said 178,000 and change. The uh, explanation for that, as I understand it, is that the uh, job description uh, includes uh, not only salary, but some uh, benefits. Okay, I thought that might be the case. I was just curious because our budget thus far is only 150 grand a year. Yeah. <laughs> But there, you know, and, and again, that this would all be dependent on the qualifications and experience. So a person is not going to step into this job and automatically get the upper end of the salary range. So then what we you're might, seeing now is the job description document. And the text is, except for kicking out a couple of par the introductory paragraph and the salary paragraph, is identical to the, should be identical to the job announcement. And I want to, you know, again, this is a, this is a screening tool. This is to get our, our name out there and to attract potentially useful candidates. It's not a commitment by us to hire any particular individual. Uh, it can be subject to modification, uh, withdrawal, uh, if any circumstance arises where we think that's, uh, an, a, a, that's appropriate. Uh, but I do believe it's important to get us started uh, in recruiting. It's going to take a number of months. Uh, we need to 
get someone in place who can uh, help us get organized and take some of the load off James and, and our current uh, vice chairman. Uh, so I would like to propose a motion that we accept the job announcement uh, send it back to the city manager with the understanding that it will be posted on the CRP, on the city jobs website and on the NACAL job postings. I second that motion. Okay. Mr. Brown? Yes. Ms. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Evans? No. Ms. Gilmore? Ms. Gilmore? Yeah, I think. He's muted, it looks like. Hit your mute button. Okay, I'll circle back. Ms. Gilmore, if you're muted, if you would unmute your microphone. Um, Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Mendez? Yes. And Mr. Watson? Yes. Okay. Are there any special instructions, Brian, for Ms. Gilmore? Since she's she's, she's back. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ms. Gilmore, your vote. Okay. Tell me again what we voting on. Mr. Chairman. Oh, he's, he's I, was on, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> Ms. Gilmore, uh, in the in the uh, ordinance uh, for our for our review board, uh, the city is 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 going to hire a uh, executive director to compliment us. I think that's very critical because it'll be a full time person that will you know be a liaison between us and the city. In this whole entire operation right now, we, we are 100% volunteer oriented, and um, that that is impacting our effectiveness. So I, I I think there's a dire need for this to happen, and the position actually pays really well, too. Mm -hmm. Just my <laughs> my spin on it. So so what we just voted on is whether or not uh, to move forward with. Uh, a draft of the job announcement and description so that uh, Dr. Richardson can get it out and advertise because it'll, it'll probably take a while to find somebody. Plus we're in this pandemic, so I don't know how quickly, you know, somebody's gonna jump on it and get interviewed and all that. That's what we voted on. Okay, that's fine. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. okay. Right. So then, uh, okay. So then, that is a we can confirm that the that the app the application and the announcement will go forward. Okay, Mr. Wheeler, can you pull up the uh, procurement page for the CR for the uh, our legal representation. Yep, this is the landing page on the city website for all bid postings and under request for proposals, we've got the legal services bid. And I'm gonna open that up for you. So so what this is, is uh, we are, we in our ordinance also, ordinance and bylaws have um, money allocated to hire uh, legal representation. And that's also a good thing. So we don't have to depend on the, the city's uh, legal representation, who is Mr. Blair. Mr. Blair is very helpful, but you know we wanna be an independent board. And uh, I'm not a lawyer, but there can be conflict of interest when you depend on the uh, city's in-house uh, lawyer for, for all your um, legal advice. Uh, when we looked through or we talked about putting this out there for proposals from uh, law firms. The big thing for me that I wanted to see is that they would uh, add a component of this that would give preference to minority owned or female owned uh, small 
uh, law firms. And um, you can see, actually, can you scroll to two, back to page two? There's a minority business program up. So well, that, that's, you know, that's part of the table of contents, but it that, that will take you to where it describes the minority business program. So I think that's uh, part of sort of changing a narrative too. Uh, Charlotte, the city of Charlottesville, a few years ago, uh, Dr. Bellamy had un uncovered that the city of Charlottesville had only hired, I think it was less than 1% of minority owned firms to do various, uh, provide various services. So this is one, this is a step that can, you know, begin in that cycle. And um, I'm, I'm glad to be able to, you know, do something that can contribute to that. Anybody have any uh, questions about the legal representation RFP? So this has this has been posted, and so we don't need to take any action, basically. Right. Yeah. And okay. right. Exactly. I, All right. So we. Uh, what time we got here? We got 15, 16 minutes. Okay, so let me let me let me double check that, that this is still accurate. I think Stuart, it looked like your your face went away, but you were uh, talking about transitioning out of the uh, vice chair position. Is that still accurate? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so uh, I hope you're taking notes though on this meeting so far. <laughs> 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 As we got to rewatch it. Um, so that being the case, Stuart wants to uh, roll out of the vice chair position and he still wants to be part of the board. So we've got to reelect a new vice chair. Um, or, or no, do we do it? Like I saw John Blair pop up, so it might be a next meeting thing. What you got, Mr. Blair? <laughs> Well, all I wanted to say is, Mr. Evans, um, would you mind just for the record, and and you are the minute taker as well, just um, stating that that you are going to that you are resigning your position as vice chair of the board, just so that there is a a record of that before this vote's taken. Oh, sure. Yeah, I resigned by email like a week ago. So. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to confirm that I I resigned by email and. Okay. Um, I think that now we need to nominate folks, right? Yep. I'd like to nominate Ms. Johnson as vice chair. Nominate who? Who <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> did he say? You said you, ma'am. <laughs> you told me earlier this right. week, you said. <laughs> you know what? You know what, guys? Uh, thank you, but um, I I don't want to accept um, being vice chair um, because, quite frankly, I'm not really sure of where I will be headed as far as staying on, and I'm a little bit on the fence right now. So it wouldn't be a good thing for me to accept a, to accept that position because I truly don't know what the future is going to hold for me as far as staying on. So. Um, I'm sorry, but I do thank you, but um, that's not, I, it's not going to work for me right now. Well, I'd like to nominate Ms. Carpenter then. I think, uh, you know, Nancy's brought up before that it shouldn't just be the guys being in leadership position. So I want to make sure that we have diversity across all aspects of the board. Mm hmm mm, Thank you, Stuart, for that. That's well said, but I must respectfully decline. All right, Bellamy. <laughs> well, we got Philip can't do it, right? Because he's a non-voting member. Can a non-voting member you be a chair, vice chair? No, sir. So no. Uh, unless unless Miss Gilmore is interested. No, thank you. <laughs> Man, what did I get myself? What did I get myself into? <laughs> I'll do it. I, if you want to do me. it, Bill, or if you'll have me, Mr. Bellamy, you didn't want to do it. Well, I didn't. I didn't. Res I didn't respond. Go ahead. Here's what I'll do. I'm going to actually move to nominate Bellamy Brown. 
as uh, vice chair. Mr. Mendez, do you have any issue with I saw that? Blair, I saw Blair pop up. No, no. <laughs> That's no my problem. buddy, though, man. <laughs> yep. Say again. I, I thought Mr. Blair popped up maybe to remind you, Mr. Watson, that you, we, you can only second. Right. Motion. Right. Yeah. Okay. Someone else will make that motion. Okay. So, so, but we're at a point where only two people, you know, Guillermo's name is still on there, but he's not on the board, unfortunately. We could use you back. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him. He said no. <laughs> Mm -mm -mm. That's not good. Well, I'm waiting for someone to nominate me if if that is their desire. I, I will do the do the post. I, I move to nominate Mr. Mendez as vice chair. Anybody else? You got 11 minutes. You can second, James. <laughs> can we have, let me ask you, I guess we can't have co-vice chairs, can we? That would be crazy. <laughs> well, you know, we're all, we're all equal. Things are liable to be changing, uh, certainly for the, in terms of our organization, um, as the, as we mature, I, I'm certainly willing to do it for. Okay. I'll stand. You know, I'll stand. I'll, I'll, I'll second, Mr. Mendez. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 Mr. Mendez has been working his behind off, and uh, I, I appreciate his hard work, and also appreciate his his retired status. <laughs> well, yeah, you guys. I, I don't know how I could do it if I had a job. I got the three kids going on in the, in the full time job, so it's. It's homeschool and all that good stuff. I'll but, just uh, remind everyone too that um, you know, according to the current bylaws, we, we have an, another election for both of these positions coming up, uh, the first meeting in the next calendar year. So, oh good, uh, keep that in mind. All right, okay, well, well, uh, congratulations, Bill, and uh, I think you have to vote, right? What did we? Oh, that's right, we didn't do that, did we? Yes. Okay, okay uh, Ms. Robinson, can we call the vote on nominating uh, Bill Mendez as vice chair? Sure. Mr. Brown? Yes. Ms. Carpenter? Uh, yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Gilmore? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Mendez? I'm sorry. Well, I suppose you could vote for yourself. Um, <laughs> And uh, Mr. Watson. Yes. Okay, well, that makes Bill the uh, official vice chair. We got um, nine minutes, 830. Um, community outreach and advisory panel. Right now, I'm feeling like, you know, we need a strategy to begin to connect with the community that we're serving. And that's probably one of the, probably the most important thing, right? And we're all in our homes right now. Um, and it's nine minutes, eight minutes. I don't know if we're going to be able to solve that. I, mm -hmm. didn't, I don't have anything solved. I've, I've kind of reached out to a few groups here and there. Not every group wants to be part of the review board either. I'm, I'm finding out. Yes, sir. Evan or Stuart. Um, sorry to interrupt. I was going to suggest that maybe um, in the spirit of wrapping things up on time or as close as we can be, we just sort of um, sort of triage and combine B and C in a way here. Uh, so we could, I think we need to talk as a group um, probably more than at time we have uh, about what kind of subcommittees we want. So I was going to suggest that I think we all agree we probably want at least a community outreach subcommittee with two people on it. Definitely. Definitely. So we could uh, we could just do that one today and then um, talk about the other subcommittees either in between meetings or at the next one. Just a suggestion. I know. Yeah, no, I, I agree because we like I said we're we're um, running out of time and um, I, I think we need uh, 
my, my thought on the whole subject is we, we need, we need, um, you know, a more diverse, you know, group of people that are, that are in the neighborhoods that are being over policed. And, uh, while we're here to fight and, and represent and help, and that's why we are doing this, you know, that's not where we live. Right. And, uh, even if it's where some of us are from, it's like, you know, we want to be connected with, with, with people. Right, who uh, can can you know explain what's what's happening, what's working, what's not working, all that kind of thing. Um, I live, like in, you, you I live in one of those neighborhoods, though. Okay, that means you can be the lead if you're not the vice chair. You could be our lead <laughs> um, subcommittee advisory guru, mm -hmm. and and we can get connected with some folks and. Um, I know I would have loved to have, have be part of some events, even you know if they would have had a normal back to school event, you yeah. know by now. But um, but we can make it happen. I'm, I'm, I'll put a mask on and I love people. Anybody knows me, I know I love people. So um, I want to connect with the people best we can. Okay, yeah. that sounds yeah. like a plan. I'll do what I can. You know, I'll reach I'll, out yeah. to my to my na the um, neighborhood association president. She lives over here as well. So I can reach out to her and see what we might come up with. You know, Guillermo recommended or talked about how they had two people on each committee mm -hmm. to avoid uh, having to have well, a public, public meeting. meeting. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, maybe if Miss Johnson's going to take the lead on that one. So I, I'm a big believer in people doing what they want, like what they're interested in. So, you know, if, if so rather than taking another vote and taking up time, if someone wants to volunteer. Hey, nobody, no, never, never mind. I don't yeah. know, I just a suggestion oh. to like get a second person to volunteer and then, I don't know. Well, I hope somebody else gonna be on there with me. I ain't gonna do it by myself. What about some, <laughs> women, power? What about some women power? <laughs> that, Nancy, you can help me. I I can be your left, cause I'm left, I guess I'd be the left-hand person. <laughs> I, I would like to see Philip part of that too. And I think one of the things he brings to the table is I believe he runs the aquatic center and uh, which is next to the boys and girls club. I think that, that, that is one of your jobs, right? Philip. Yeah, that's one of my facilities. Yeah. Okay. So I, I imagine if you've been around Charlottesville, you know, a lot of uh, people and kids and neighborhoods and, you know, so, and the three of y'all can be the, the three-headed community engagement. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can hear you. Not not that great though, but I can hear you. Okay, because I spoke up earlier and nobody seemed to hear me. And then my microphone, maybe it was my microphone. No, I'll be more than happy to help with that. Uh, uh, just this past weekend and out in, at, at the um, pavilions and our centers, uh, I ran across three birthday parties. People were celebrating the former students of mine at Buford. So um, any way I can help with that. And uh, allow me just a moment to make a comment because I was trying to make a comment when you guys were discussing about, and I know this is a little belated, but um, I, I thought this board, I thought our charge was to deal with the issues of misconduct and reducing misconduct and to better understand each other to where us, the police the community, we just don't just coexist. It's a valid question about how the police spend a day, however, uh, we're not, I don't think we were into micromanaging daily operations. That question could have been, hey, can we ride along with you? Or could they invite us to ride along? Um, if even that's allowed, it just appears to me that this process, and I know that it's gonna take time, but we are really taking baby steps to better understand and accept that we need each other uh, to make this work. And hopefully in time we can. So I'm committed to that. I'll help you in the communities to try to bridge gaps, extend olive, olive branches, both into the communities and to the law enforcement community. I just want you guys to know I'm committed to that. In any way I can help, don't bother to, you know, please contact me. I'm here at Smith, we're undergoing a renovation and uh, we'll be moving to <clears throat> various parts of the city. But yes, I uh, do oversee the aquatic and one of the fitness centers here in the city. So any way I can help, please ask. Definitely. And, you know, if you have ideas and that's anybody on this board, if you have an idea that's just burning in your heart, go for it. Right. Because like I said, we don't get to physically be together. And uh, I don't think anybody, there's really any wrong answers. 
And so, like, Philip, anybody, if you're like, man, this is what we could be doing, this big event or this, you know, here's an opportunity to connect with people, let's do it. Go for it. Don't wait for me. You know, time is limited and uh, just jump on it. And, and I'm, I'm sure most of us, all of us will be there to support you or as many people who, who can particularly physically be there. Go yeah, I just want to sort of maybe to, to uh, bring us back around. Um, I remember that you sent out a uh, email, James, on uh, July 20th, which had that spreadsheet of areas of interest and expertise uh, and activities on it, uh, and tentative lists of names uh, of people who might be interested. Uh, maybe I suggest that by the next uh, next meeting, we look at that again and take it kind of seriously and put our names down for activities that we're interested in. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll, I'll recirculate that uh, spreadsheet. Which it was basically based off of uh, a lot of what Guillermo was talking about, uh, what they did last time when they broke out in the, in the various uh, groups. Um, anyway, as time is going down really quickly, I explained earlier that, that we are going to do some Nicole training. I'm going to send you guys the username and password and explain all that via email. Uh, ideally, though, we can all take um, six classes between today and the end of uh, December. And then we'll have 32 available, so you can keep taking them after uh, December on into the new year. Uh, I want to get public comment in. That's, that's probably the most important part. And we're probably, I don't know if the city can let us run another 12 minutes or so. That uh, up to Wheeler, city manager. But if we can get keep going for a little bit, here's some public comment. That'd be great. I'll put another couple quarters in the system. We're good. All right. Hey, you know what, uh, Mr. Wheeler, you play the best jazz music, man. During the when I listen to the city council meeting between the and during the breaks, they play some really great jazz. <laughs> well, it, that's from my staff, and it must be uh, free and and copyright free. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Uh, if you'd like to address the board, we're gonna take uh, three, uh, well, three minutes for each speaker. You can just click the raise hand icon in the Zoom webinar. This will be the last chance for public comment tonight. We do have a- We, we put them all to sleep. We or had maybe... one, one hand up go briefly, but then it went down. Joy, okay, Tracy Hopper. Tracy, you're on with the board. You've got three minutes, go ahead. Hey. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm a Charlottesville citizen, and I actually had two questions. One was about, I was listening about the committee composition with Ms. Carpenter and Ms. Johnson. I heard Mr. Evans talk about in order to avoid the FOIA problem, there had to be two people on the committee or you had to call a public meeting. So I just wondered, since Mr. Shea is a non-voting member, Mr. Blair, does that avoid that problem? If the committee meets and there are three, do you have to call a public meeting or, or because Mr. Shea is non-voting? So can I ask my other question, Mr. Blair, and then I'll, I'll stop. The second thing to the whole committee is I have reviewed the DMC recommendations, both for the city and the county, and twofold, I would hope that this CRB has an opportunity to develop a committee to take a look at this so we can look to see how the, for accountability for the sake of the community, our community members. And also, um, oh my gosh, I'm too young to have this happen to me where I forget what I'm gonna say. <laughs> um, I guess I'll just stop with that right now, unless I have an inspiration before the clock takes. <laughs> but I, I guess, is the CRB gonna take a look at the DMC? I hope so. Oh, oh, I know what it was. The other issue is whatever you can do connected to cooperating with the county, looking at the DMC too, the county seems not to have taken a look at this and to bring them to the table to work with you on it would be wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. 
If you'd like to speak to the board, just click the raise hand icon. And uh, Ms. Joy Johnson, I've seen your hand come up a couple of times, but it's not staying up. I'm gonna click on your name and just make sure you. I'll say, don't be shy. Ms. Johnson, you're, if you wanna unmute, you're welcome to address the board. If you ignore me, I will just turn that off. Okay, I'm not shy by any means. <laughs> um, my name is Joy Johnson. I reside at 8028 Hardy Drive. I just have one procedural question. When you all voted for the vice chair, I did not hear you all call on Ms. Deirdre Gilmore for her vote. We got our vote, didn't we? I didn't hear it. We, we did. You gave her an explanation of what we were voting for. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. That was, no, I think that was for the executive director position. That was for the job position. Right, right. But but when we voted. For Mr. Mendez, you didn't call on Ms. Gilmore. You were very thorough. Yes. We, okay. Yeah, so I'm I did have that mix. i person. Right. You, you're right about that, um, uh, Mr. Chair, but I did call her name. Uh, we, I'd be glad to, to hear from her again to make sure I recorded her vote correctly, though. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, did you want to address that issue now or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm just going to ask um, Ms. Gilmore, just to just to verify, you you voted for Mr. Mendez to be the co uh, vice chair. Yes. All right. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeffrey Fogel. Jeff, you're on with the board. Go ahead. Good evening. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed something because I joined late, but I was just turned down by Internal Affairs on a complaint that I filed, and. Um, I want to know that whether or not the review board is prepared to handle these appeals, which I will be filing tomorrow. Is this a moment of us answering uh, Mr. Fogel's question? We're not required to answer. Mm -hmm. We can. If okay. Like. Yeah. We're we're aware of what you're saying, and we'll 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 go back in our huddle and and, and figure out where, uh, how to assist. Thank you, Mr. Fogel. <laughs> and there are no other hands raised at this time. Oh, well, Mr. Fogel has raised his hand again. So, Mr. Fogel, you're back on. I'd appreciate if you would explain to me what you just said because I have no idea. You said you filed. All I'm asking is, right. is the review board prepared to do its job of reviewing a complaint that has been not sustained by the civilian, by the police department? The answer okay. is yes. Okay, good. That's all I wanted to know. Then follow the procedures or contact us if you have any questions. Right. I mean, we don't, you don't file an appeal with us necessarily. Right. You can review. Well, there's no, I'm not even positive the word appeal shows up in the ordinance. You can, re, I mean, reach out to us if you have any questions about it, but you can file an initial complaint with us or with this or dual file with us in the CPD. And they have 75 days to respond. And if you disagree with it, you can file a review request with us. Mr. Wheeler, is there anybody uh, on deck? Is that it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Tracy Hopper has raised her hand again, and I'll leave that up to you if you'd like me okay. to. We're um, over time. I'll, we'll make this the very last one, and then uh, we're going to adjourn the meeting. Tracy, go ahead. Chair Watson, thank you. And all I wanted, I interrupted, I think Mr. Blair was gonna answer the FOIA question and I asked to finish my other comment. I was wondering if he could, if he would see fit to answer that question. Thank you.
Um, Mr. Chair, is, is it okay to, <clears throat> to respond now? Yeah. Oh, I'm on mute. Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. Um, what I would suggest on this, uh, the um, group that's been designated is that they not be termed a subcommittee at this point for FOIA purposes, but instead there, there will be two members and they can work with Mr. C, but I would advise again that the three of you do not talk at the same time and that you come back at the next meeting with a report on how you want to really have the, the CRB uh, formulate its plan for community engagement. Great. All right. All right, everybody. Uh, appreciate everybody being here and staying up late and working together and uh, solid meeting. Um, I see the city manager just popped up. I don't know if he wants to share any information with us or anything, but. Uh, no, not tonight. Um, okay. We got the information uh, that you uh, that we talked about and uh, right. we'll start working on that in the morning. Okay, great. All right. Thank Everybody you. have a good night and uh, we'll call this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.